she was full of the magic. It just oozed all out of her. She was always working it. There are people who have a look in their eye. They want the big prize. They chased one goal relentlessly. Jennifer wasn't about waiting. She was about, I want the job now. Well, if she lost the foot, she'd come to rehearsal. She had a vision in mind, and I don't think she was afraid to make any enemies. Through struggles. Her family wanted her to take a different path in life. And setbacks. People were upset. I'm still hiding from everybody. She didn't get the job. You know, something didn't work out. Her mother's saying, hey, I want to hear it. Some people are just driven. An ambitious city kid's defiant pursuit of superstardom. Jennifer made it known. I'm going to be enormous. You don't understand how famous I'm going to be. And we were all like, yeah, yeah, Jennifer. Never before seen images, stories, and revelations from the people who know what really happened. Her father physically dragged her out of my studio because they lived it with her. She goes, honey, I dreamed of this my whole life. This is Driven. Jennifer Lopez. was born July 24th of 69. If she grew up in uh, the Castle Hill area of the Bronx, it was a typical middle class experience. Jennifer was very proud of her roots of being Puerto Rican. Their house was nice. You know, it just smelled like home when you went in there. Jennifer's family was a very close-knit family. There were her parents, Lupe and David, and her older sister, Leslie, and her younger sister, Linda. I always remember Jen and her dad being very, very close. Jen looks like her father. Jennifer's parents were strict Catholics and had pressed upon the importance of religion on Jennifer as she was growing up, and that's why they sent her to Catholic school. Holy Family was a Catholic uh, elementary school. Jennifer was a great student, and if she wasn't doing the best she can, she wasn't satisfied with it. She was someone who was very dedicated, motivated, and very ambitious. Jennifer was on the track team, the girls softball team, and during the week she also went to dance classes. Kim's Bay Boys and Girls Club was a second home to Jennifer. Jen found an outlet in Kips Bay where they had the formal training, so that's where she developed her talent. Her mom was really, really into the arts. No matter what, Lupe was always singing. Around the house, she always had music playing, from salsa to whatever the hits of the day were, to the Broadway show tunes. Jennifer's favorite musical growing up was West Side Story, because it had the Puerto Rican angle. The first time I met Jennifer was in the cafeteria at Preston High School. It was an all-girls Catholic school. We all used to congregate in the morning before classes started. Sometimes there was a radio going, and a little dancing and talking, and then the bell rang, we'd all take off. Schoolwork came very easily to Jennifer, and she always got really good grades. She would never evaluate herself in terms of the next student or the student ahead of her. She set her own standards, always seemed to be quite independent. Dave and Jen got together in 85. David was her one true love. When they were together, they were absolutely one person. And it wasn't like in a sickening way either. They were just Dave and Jen. It was like one word. She used to write David and Jennifer on all her notebooks and things like that. She was really crazy about them for a long time. I think Jen's parents always wanted more for her than to just stay with one person and be that serious, only because Dave and Jen were young. From what I know of Jennifer's parents, they were very strict. They expected her to get home right away after school, her homework to be done. Good grades were expected. Jen's mom really instilled education in her, getting that piece of paper. And that could have been a source of the struggle between the two. Jen fought with her parents. I mean, at that age, your parents say black, you say white. It's like any struggle. You just want more freedom than your parents let you have, period. Jennifer was always singing and dancing, always in school through the streets, didn't matter where. If there was anything to do with theater or dance, Jennifer was there. She was in the drama club, and they did a production of God's Spell. She danced and sang and basically was the star. Very graceful and very fluid 
in her motion. The person looked to Jennifer as a role model. She was always one with a sense of style. At one point, there was a rule where you couldn't wear earrings larger than a quarter. Jennifer mounted this great defense on how this was just so unfair, and she made a very good argument. Of course, it didn't change the rules, but she was very passionate. Jen was very opinionated. If she had something to say, she said it. She'd be an excellent lawyer. She worked for this lawyer actually in the neighborhood. She was a part-time worker, doing at first like secretarial functions. Because she was so bright, she was able to take on a lot of paralegal type functions. She would prepare a summons and complaint. She would have dealings with other lawyers. And I was able to entrust her with a lot, even though she was only 18 at the time. We had a business 1000 class. I remember Jen and I studying on the six train, going down to school, reading our books out loud, and everybody looking at us like, shut up. But we just kept studying and studying. I don't think Jen was happy in college. At one point, she decided, I want to give this whole dancing thing a try. She picked up a newspaper one night, and there was an advertisement for dance scholarships. So she went on the audition for that. The first time that I saw Jennifer was at the audition at Phil Black's studio. Phil Black was a famous choreographer, and Des Calderon was a longtime student of Phil's. I auditioned a lot of kids because I needed a core group of performers. It was that moment, I think, when Jennifer went on the dance audition that everything just opened up for her. Ladies, you ready? I gave them a little dance routine to follow. Although she was a beginner and couldn't get all of the choreography, there was nothing that threw her. That's what happens, you know, the ones that really want they don't shy away. They attack. I also wanted to know a little bit about them as a person, so I was asking people to describe themselves. She wrote, ambitious, hardworking, and dedicated, and I'm also responsible. That's what my mother says. By the time I'm 20 or 21, I will be dancing professionally. That's what I see myself doing. I don't have that much money, and my parents said that I want to do this, I'll have to do it on my own. She seemed so determined. She sold me. All right, now I want you to dance. My first impression of Jennifer was, I can't say that I was totally intimidated, but I was a little bit. Because <laughs> she was from, like, the Bronx and whatever, the city, and I was from Pennsylvania. She said, a year from now, everybody's going to know my name. You could see the passion. You could see ambition. And this was before I even saw her dance. When you learn a dance step, it was kind of like she had her own little twist on it. And smiling a lot, you know, real perky and sexy, and sex kind of game. Flushing through. Oh. She could cut loose. She had energy. Oh. She was someone that responded with commitment to the idea that she's going to be a performer no matter what it took. In the mirror, she would watch herself, but she would smile as though she was doing a performance. Jennifer was a little bit concerned about her weight. She would say things like, I know I have a big butt. <laughs> she definitely had a butt. You know, I think she felt a little self-conscious about that. She would wear tights with parachute pants on top, you know, to kind of, like, take the emphasis away. I don't think what's under there. One time she was standing in the mirror, and she was looking at herself, and she said, I like my body like this. I think it gives me an edge. She's a very direct person. She definitely had a tough side. I think she did have a softer side at that time also, but it wasn't the type of place that she was going to let it show. I realized that she was hungry and she was willing to work. I saw that as a really attractive thing. Plus, she's very pretty. Very shortly after Jennifer arrived, Des and Jennifer had a connection. They did have a lot in common. I think she trusted me. She knew that I cared about her as a teacher or as a friend. Des was her mentor in a lot of ways. She found somebody that could really give her a lot of special attention. Jennifer was willing to work hard, and that's why I worked with her. You know, if she lost a foot, she'd come to rehearsal. I think she wanted to, like, do her best for him, you know, impress him. And she definitely knew where to hitch her wagon. 
she was going to college, she was working for me, and she was involved with Dez and the dancing. And there were a lot of times where at the last moment, I would expect her to be in and she couldn't make it. And then she started missing classes. I was like, what is going on here? So I had a discussion with her. And she goes, well, what should I do? I just don't have enough time to do everything. I think at that point, Jen was still trying to find her way. Like, do I really want to do this school thing? Yeah, I want to be a lawyer, but my heart is now elsewhere. Her parents were very, very set on having her go to school and become, you know, a respectable member of society. But what she needed to do was become a performer. So I went out on a limb. I would never, ever tell anybody this. I said, you have to drop out of school. You're too talented. She started realizing, you know, I'm good. She took a chance. She just left school, and that created a lot of conflict for her at home. In fact, she had to leave home because as an ultimatum, her mother said, if you live here, you can't do that. I think they were just two very strong-willed Puerto Rican women who wanted what they wanted and didn't want to give an inch at all. She ultimately moved in with Des and they lived together for a while. He kind of took her under his wing and helped train her and helped try and get her work. Jennifer's parents were not happy at all that she was living with Des. There was one day when her father came to the studio. There was quite a bit of commotion. Her father, across the big scene, physically dragged her out of my studio. Entertainment, it's not a stable career. It's not a Monday to Friday, nine to five job. Knowing that her parents didn't approve of her becoming a dancer, I think that was even more a driving force. Jen's the type of person that the more someone tells her she can't do something, by golly, she's gonna do it. Jen wanted to prove her mother wrong. This is going to be a good thing. You will be proud of me. Coming up, as a young dancer, Jennifer sends a clear message to the competition. She had a vision in mind, and I don't think that she was afraid to make any enemies. Then, she chases her dream overseas, and when things don't go her way, gets little sympathy from her folks. Jen would call her mom, you know, something didn't work out, and her mother saying, hey, I don't want to hear it. And later, emotions run high as Jennifer transforms herself into Selena. She really captured Selena. He couldn't take it. He was visibly moved because his daughter had, in a way, come back to life. I met Jennifer at the Phil Black Des Calderon Studios. They were rehearsing for some nightclub act. She was very focused. Des had this little dance company that would perform around the clubs. We like to work with the Roxy, the Cat Club, just about every club that had an actual stage. It was a great training ground for any dancer. You teach them how to captivate a crowd, how to give more attitude. Right now, Roxy, would you please put your hands together? <laughs> club had a real urban edge and so the choreography would have that down and dirty gritty element to it sort of a campy sexy trashy feel to it but classy oh, she was sexy as all get out she liked going to the club she liked being out and in the limelight and in front of people sort of getting her wings des had special feelings for her he wanted to see her really succeed so he would always make room for her in any project that the studio was doing there was a lot of girls that would wanted to be in these dance company things and he only picked a few she always had such a good presence and i used to like putting her in everything i did a lot of people got jealous at that she had a vision in mind she knew where she wanted to go and i don't think that she was afraid to make any enemies people liked jennifer but I don't think she was extremely open to everyone. Kind of a loner and very focused, very, you know, always thinking about what the next move was. I didn't really know of anybody that was really close with her. I think that maybe that would have gotten in the way. She wanted to prove something to her family and herself to become the best she could be. When Jen really decided, this is how it's going to be, and this is what I want to do, I think her mom finally came around. There was a reconciliation between her and her mother. The whole struggle was just a love thing. You want the best for your children. 
she did little videos, little this, little that. That's what beginner dancers do when you find whatever you can. Yo, yo, welcome to Yo MTV Raps. Yo MTV Raps was looking for a site to shoot one of their shows, and they decided to shoot it in our studio. I'm looking for the Phil Black Calderon Production Dance Studios. It happened to be the episode with MC Hammer. Yo, and we'd just like improvise these dance moves and they'd run the camera up and down the row of girls. I do remember them specifically pointing her out and saying, you move over here, which was more at a, a, another focal point than the other dancers. Then they asked two of the girls to stand on either side of MC Hammer during his interview. Jennifer was one of those girls. I first met Jennifer at the airport. We were flying together to go to do this Golden Musicals of Broadway tour. And the show was basically a Broadway review. That was probably her first really legitimate type of dance job. Let's go. This was definitely the tour from hell. We traveled in a great big bus that said Golden Musicals of Broadway on the side. We were on the bus anywhere from four to eight hours. It was very disorganized. But I could always remember Jennifer looking good. She looked beautiful all the time. When there was no way that makeup was going to happen early in the morning, Jennifer always had red lipstick, always looked like a million bucks. The costumes were a nightmare on this whole tour. There was this big bin of, like, Salvation Army clothes. And they're like, ah, find something to wear. I'll just put something on. They were just thrown together. I mean, it was like the little rascals doing the show. <laughs> Her main feature was being the white cat in the cat's numbers. The customer did spend time with her. That's what she wanted. She demanded, okay, make me look good. I'm the white cat. Make me look like the white cat. Where the rest of us were like, did somebody stick a piece of fur on my butt? When things went awry on the tour, which they did daily, Jennifer made it known. This is not good. Mm -mm, I'm not going to take this. She can be big and bad when she needed to be. She was from the Bronx. She said what she felt. Everybody on the whole tour did an impression of Jennifer. You don't understand how fierce I am. I'm just, I'm huge. I'm going to be enormous. You don't understand how famous I'm going to be. And we were all like, yeah, yeah, Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer wanted to be doing the vocal leads, but she was primarily in the dancer role. She understudied a woman who did have a few solos, and as it turned out, Jennifer had to go on for this woman this particular day. She had to do Anita in West Side Story, so she had to do the big America number. It was the happiest I saw her on the whole tour. That was the role for her. She wanted to be in the spotlight throughout the whole show. If it was possible, she would have loved that, but unfortunately, I don't think the powers that be thought she had the right voice for it. It bothered her that she wasn't getting to do what she knew that she was capable of doing. It drove her nuts. Jen would call her mom, you know, something didn't work out, and her mother saying, hey, I want to hear it. Jen was like, you know, can you let me cry on your shoulder? And Jen's like, no, you know? This is the path you chose. These things are going to happen. You're the only one that can fix it. Sometimes those experiences give us the kick that fuels us over the edge. Don't tell me no, because I know yes. When the show was over and there was talk about the tour continuing, she said no, she couldn't go on. She needed to get back to New York and to get to class. She knew that she had to be as good as she can get in order to compete. When she came back from Europe, I was in pre-production for this Chess King thing. It was a kind of like a dance fashion show. So she walked in and I said, great, I'm glad you're back. I need you for this show. The theme was like Americana, like the disco theme and Easy Rider theme. You know, let's pretend we're on motorcycles. You know, <laughs> it's kind of cheesy stuff like that. It becomes a consensus that she is the star or the main focus of our production. She's everybody's favorite. She really seemed more determined and more comfortable as a performer than she had ever been before. She had arrived, and it was just a matter of, let's see who else notices. Coming up, the dream role Jennifer was sure she'd land doesn't come through. She was quite upset and depressed about the whole thing, and she said, oh, I'm just going to go home and eat. And then, a bit part on TV puts her on the network's radar. Mira, no empiece conmigo porque yo no juego, okay? I said, who is that girl? But later, in the biggest acting opportunity of her career, Jennifer faces a backlash before she even hits the set. People were upset. I'm sick of hiding from everybody! She had a lot of pressure on her. 
If you've got the admission bell on Northdale Mabry, don't miss it. I remember walking down the street and Jennifer was walking toward me and she walked right by me and I said, where are you going? And she said, audition. And she just went off. She went to an audition for Chorus Line. She tried out for the part of Morales. Being that she is from the Bronx, Latin American, she thought, hey, you know, I'm perfect for this. I do remember somebody saying to her, there's a lot of competition out there. And she said, I'm not worried. She didn't get the job. So she was quite upset and depressed about the whole thing. And she said, oh, I'm just going to go home and eat. She wanted to be a star tomorrow. She didn't want it in, like, five years. She wanted it, like, the next day. So there was a little, like, angst there. I want this now. About two days later, she goes to an audition for In Living Color. Living Color. In Living Color had really been established as, you know, number one kind of comedy sketch show. The best part of In Living Color were the fly girls. A fly girl was a dancer. Fly meaning hip. When it, the original fly girls was leaving. So they had this nationwide contest to find a new dancer. I heard that there were between 800 and 1,000 dancers. So they were picking one. The winner that they found was named um, Carla Garrido. So that was that, and it was over. Next thing I find out, there was something happened with Carla not being able to do it, and Jennifer Lopez was the runner-up. Jennifer was the one that ended up being the final fly girl. I remember her telling me that she got it, and she was so excited. It was big news. I mean, everybody was like, wow, somebody got out. The only thing that was sad was that she was going to have to relocate to uh, Los Angeles. So we always know people have to go. Yo, this is Jenna for the new fly girl in the house, Puerto Rican, straight from the Bronx. Rosie Perez was the choreographer of the Fly Girls. Rehearsals were very intense. How much time? We sometimes didn't finish until like 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, here we, go, folks. we earned yeah, our money on In Living Color, for sure. <laughs> the kind of steps and moves that they were doing were very intricate. Jennifer and I both had an attitude like we were the best. It's just kind of a New Yorker's attitude thing. We were just kind of living out our fantasy, and sometimes her and I would just dress up in the dressing room and model and pose. She just knew how to work it. Very innocent and sexy at the same time. That works. Men love that. By the time In Living Color was canceled was about the time Jennifer and I started to dance with Janet. Janet was a friend of mine, and I referred Jennifer to her. We had a lot of fun, and Jennifer doing her little flavor with the, you know, Latin. She was working it. Jennifer had a goal of being a recording artist and a dancer. She definitely had dreams for herself. Jennifer came to Giant Records. From the moment she walked in the door, she lit the room up. She was full of the magic. It just oozed all out of her. She had a very clear vision of what kind of record and what kind of artist she would be. She wanted to do something that would really allow her to showcase her ability to dance thing, take a lot of her roots and the New York thing and the salsa thing. And at the time, you had Paula Abdul, Janet Jackson, Madonna. You don't have to be able to sing like Whitney Houston to have a successful recording career. We kind of batted the idea around with other executives at Giant. And I don't remember anybody like being as passionate or excited about it as I was. Interestingly enough, we didn't end up doing a deal. So she kind of felt like she needed to abandon the music thing and revisit it after she had accomplished a certain level of success. That was when Jennifer got the call to audition for South Central. Jennifer, as far as I knew, she didn't have a lot of acting experience, but she clearly had something. There are people who have a look in their eye, they want the big prize, and they're determined to get it. Jennifer clearly had that 
so we uh, brought her in to audition for South Central as soon as she read. And we said, that's it. You got the part. Jennifer was, at the time, dancing with Janet. So she calls me just frantic, and she's like, I can't decide because I'm supposed to be on tour with Janet, but this is TV, and I want to be able to do this. And I was like, are you crazy? You have an opportunity to be on a TV show. There's no question. In the 90s, there was almost no Latino presence in primetime television. Michael really wanted to make sure that this show reflected what South Central was, and that includes having African Americans, that includes having a Latina. Sorry, I can't take your check. Why? Is the food free today? Ha ha, no. <laughs> your name is on the return list. Even though we were going to be shooting the pilot for CBS, the chances of it getting on the air for CBS were not great. During the rehearsal, we had our network run through where the network executives come down and see it. And Jeff Zagansky was the head of CBS uh, television at that time. I went over there to see whether the South Central was going to be uh, something that we'd be interested in in the long term. Don't get an attitude with me, lady. Well, then you get somebody else over here because I got an attitude and somebody's going to experience it. Mira, no empiece conmigo porque yo no juego, okay? Jennifer did her two lines. And I turned to my casting director, and I said, who is that girl? I saw him go over and talk to her, and I started to panic. I talked to her for about 10 minutes to tell her that I thought she was great. I was very nervous that Sagansky was looking to put her in something else and that he would lose her because we didn't have a contract with her beyond that pilot. Her name is on the list. Was I talking to you? Was I talking to you? She was funny. She was incandescent, and the main thing is, is that she was real. I'm sorry, I lost my temper. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, exactly as I feared, CBS did not buy the South Central pilot, but in fact made a deal with Jennifer. We made a deal where she was uh, tied to the network for a year with the intention that we would put her as the star or a co-star in another show. Maybe if you were nice to the people, Mayo, they wouldn't have burnt down your store. I am nice. South Central was picked up on another network and ultimately didn't work. I think it was a little too real for some people. So then we thought, well, how do we use her in, in a way that's a star-making role? Eventually, two producers ended up writing a pilot for a show called Second Chances. Yes. Melinda. After we're married, we can make love anytime you want. Jennifer's role was one where she was just starting her career, and uh, she had a very overprotective father. It's my right as an American to spend and complain at the same time, just like it's your right to marry a gringo. Anglo. Not in five, five generations. Five generations in this country has a member of our family married an Anglo. I remember dating somebody at the time and making him watch it every week, and he was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, you understand, that's Jen. Kevin and Melinda. Do you freely, without reservations, give yourselves to each other in marriage? I do. I have reservations. Too many to go through with this. Sorry. What's the matter? You want me to tell everyone? What? We slept with a stripper last night. Midway through, it became clear to us that the real show was the Jennifer Lopez show. So we quickly uh, got together and figured, let's start again, and let's retitle the show Hotel Malibu. It was really focused on the Jennifer Lopez character. I know your opinion. I know all your opinions. You're very free with them. I've heard them every day of my life. I'm glad your mother isn't alive to see you like this. You talk like that, and you wonder why I'm moving out. We tried to make a deal with her after Hotel Malibu, but she actually got her first offer to be in the movies. She had her sights set on bigger things. Coming up. Jennifer drives the crowd wild as Selena. Jennifer mentioned to me that she had never had a, a, female, a high like that. Then inspires the love of her life to publicly pledge his devotion. Ohani surprised her in the middle of the dance floor, got down on one knee and proposed to her and gave her a ring. Go now to VH1.com to read about Jennifer's goals and dreams as revealed on her dance school application. Plus an exclusive look at rare photos and dance footage. Clockstoppers 411. Zach's dad invented this killer watch that can stop time. And ever since we got a hold of it. I belong here, Senor Portamon. Senor. My 
family me familia was jennifer's first movie she really wanted to do this film it was a big break for her maria i promised david Hank that i would come back to you she played the young mother she had these very emotional scenes in that it showed like producers and directors what she could do i just remember her being a little nervous before she went on, but saying, I'm gonna do great. <laughs> she just got more and more confident. She was just like itching to get another role. When Selena died, we had no idea how big the story was. When Selena got killed, I just needed to show the world what kind of person she was, her legacy. I felt that I needed to do the Selena movie. The movie Selena was very special to everybody because it was such a tragic story. We were trying to find a person to play Selena that could fit Selena not only physically, but her spirit, her personality. He was auditioning a lot of girls. They were lined up, thousands of them. And then Jennifer comes along and does her part. The thing that struck everybody about Jennifer's audition tape was the beauty, the intention to get the role, and that energy just popped out at you. I had to uh, say, that's the girl. <laughs> when we found out that Jennifer had been cast for the lead role of Selena, we were all very excited for her. And then we found out that she was the first Latina to get over a million dollars for a picture. This was uh, a barrier that had been broken. Her casting was actually a little bit controversial. People were upset. How dare we pick a Puerto Rican to play Selena, a Mexican? She had to prove herself within the Hispanic community, and then she had to prove herself in Hollywood. She had a lot of pressure on her. She went to Corpus Christi and stayed with the family so that she could understand not only the facts about this woman she was going to be playing, but see if she could feel a little bit of her energy as well. We showed her a lot of home videos. We'd be driving in the car, she'd have the Selena CDs on. It was like 24 hours Selena. She had to change her dancing style. It's one thing to do hip hop moves. It's a very different thing to represent somebody like Selena, who was a natural, who was improvisational. My first time making her up for the film. She's singing to the music. We had the music in the trailer in the background. We looked at each other and she was turning into Selena. It was so weird. And we both started to cry. And she goes, come on, Mark, we gotta be strong. Selena's family was very involved in the movie. They were on the set every day. And they wanted to make sure that the film was really true to Selena's life. And that was very difficult at times. There was a lot of things that Jennifer would say or she would do that really would freak us out. My wife said, wow, I mean, she looks so much like Selena. We'd be doing an emotional scene and Selena's mother, she just uh, you break down in tears. Jennifer approached this role with incredible humility and she understood that she was playing a woman who would otherwise be here were it not for this unbelievably tragic circumstance. And that yet this was giving her the opportunity of her career. I remember one time in the makeup room, she had this new leopard coat and she had, you know, the Selena red lipstick on and somebody took a Polaroid of her. And then I looked at it and she was like, giving major attitude in the photo, just, you know, like with the shoulder up with the sunglasses and the lipstick. And I looked at it and I go, look at you. And she goes, honey, I dreamed of this my whole life. We were recreating the Astrodome concert, which was the last big concert that Selena done about three weeks before she got killed. It was like getting ready to do a real concert. She was geared up. We shot Jennifer in the horse-drawn carriage. She came out and there's just thousands of people. They got 37,000 extras of true Selena fans to come and observe the filming. Jennifer walks on stage in the purple costume that Selena famously wore in her last performance ever. She didn't really think she 
she lip sank because it was very important to the family that Selena's voice be heard. They were screaming Selena and then Jennifer. She gave you goosebumps. The emotion was so thick you could cut it. Everybody was crying. She would get it down to every step, every hand flick, every inhale and hair flip. She had it exactly the way Selena did it. People were in shock. Abraham was standing back in a corner because he couldn't take it. He was visibly moved because his daughter had, in a way, come back to life. She really captured Selena. As they wrapped that scene, Edward James Olmos, who played her father in the film, turned to me and said, do you realize what you just saw was a star being born? Jennifer mentioned to me that she had never had a, a, fear, a high like that. She had been a dancer, she had been on television, she had been in the movies, but she'd never been on stage and felt the energy directed at her from thousands of people. And she had said, boy, would she sure love to do something like this. Jennifer always had a goal to be a singer. But during Selena, I think that really kicked in. It was almost like a glimpse into what Jennifer would become. Jennifer at the time was also in love, and when Jennifer's in love, she's very happy. Jennifer was dating Ohani. He was quiet, very handsome, very supportive guy. He'd come over from Cuba in a raft a year before that, and Jennifer told me she'd met him at a restaurant and he was waiting tables. He didn't even know she was an actress. They were really sort of lovey-dovey with each other, and wherever Jennifer was, Ohani was just a few feet away. Well, we had the rap party at the Hot Rock Cafe in San Antonio, Texas. Ohani surprised her in the middle of the dance floor, got down on one knee and proposed to her and gave her a ring. Jennifer kind of exploded. She just, like, jumped up into his arms. For the first time, I saw her be overwhelmed and be, like, <gasps> completely taken by surprise. It's got to be a great moment in her life when just sort of everything comes together. She's wrapped this incredible movie that's about to catapult her into incredible fame. She's the highest paid Latina actress in Hollywood. She's got her family and her friends. And then the man of her dreams gets down on one knee and gives her a ring. I mean, my God. <laughs> it's a perfect life at that point. Coming up, Jennifer has it all except the one thing she really wants. I remember her talking about, man, I want to get a recording contract. You know, I want to do this. Having the dream is one thing. Making the dream happen is a completely different thing. Don't you... Jennifer's film career was launched and she was going to need more attention in nurturing a musical career. Jennifer's biggest dream was to become a recording artist. I remember her talking about, man, I want to get a recording contract, you know, I want to do this. Having the dream is one thing. Making the dream happen is a completely different thing. It was pretty logical that she would have someone like Benny Medina managing her, somebody who knows stars, got all the connections, he was Puffy's manager and knew all of the things that would have to happen in order for her to have a successful recording career. Tony Matola, who was the head of Sony, if you see somebody and he likes him, he gets it going right away. And he saw, you know, that Jennifer had what it takes. The Latino thing had just started and it was taking over the market. I mean, the records were crossing over. We had a large built-in audience, a multi-ethnic, cross-cultural thing. So they went forward with their uh, very full steam. We were in the studio forever. She would work late, get up early in the morning, go to the gym, and come to sing again. She wanted to work overtime to make sure that she had the hits and the right sound. If I wanted her to get into character, very sultry and very whispery and very sexy. She had no problem trying all different kinds of vocal range experiments. She said, if I don't really do this right, if I don't pick the right song, come out strong, I'm going to really get shot down out there. People are going to say, uh, you know, oh, here we go again. Here's another actor turned singer. That challenge in and of itself gave her the drive of having something to prove that she could do this. 
got a call from somebody representing her saying Jennifer's interested in you doing her CD cover. She just said, you know, I'm new at this and I'm really putting it all on the line on this album and I have to produce great pictures. Every level of this has to be great in order for it to be successful. I waited all day for, for that shoot because of hair, makeup, politics. My head was spinning because it was just like this huge production. She finally came out and all of a sudden we decided to rush to shoot. It actually turned out that the first roll of film produced the album cover. It was a whole different circle of people and I think with her it was important to move on to another level. She was growing so fast when she was married to Ohani that even he didn't see her much. And not everybody's made for that. You know, Ohani wasn't. That's when they broke up. When Jen named her album On the Six, I laughed to myself because I said, you know, people that know her know why. When you wanted to go downtown, you went On the Six. That was the number six train. And that was our way to get out of the Bronx into the big city. We took it to school, and she practically lived on the train going down to dance class. It kind of led her to these bigger and better things, and it's kind of where it started. If You Are My Love became the first single. The moment I heard it, I was like, damn, that shit is awesome. You could see the urban Latino influence in her music. Everybody's like, is that how we be singing? Man, that's her. But when it started climbing the chart, boom, it went to number one, and I was like, dang, this is it. You can help people make a great record, but you can't help them be a star. You can't help them when it's time to put that mic in their hand and go out there and make them love you. The thing I admire most about Jennifer is that she got what she wanted. She reached the brass ring, and she wasn't going to let anybody stop her. She knows that to get from point A to point B, it takes a lot of work. I didn't get the sense from her that she would at any point sit back and put her feet up and take a rest and say, okay, you know, I've done good, now I'm gonna chill. Turn the radio on, she's there. You turn the TV on, she's there. And go to a movie, she's there. Jennifer had said, I just knew that there was another life for me that was outside of the Bronx. And she was just gonna get herself ready for when it came. I think when you have that set in your mind, you're ready to pay the price for it. Her family wanted her to take a different path in life. Jennifer had something to prove to her mother. It was definitely something that did drive her. At the end of the day, you do want your parents' approval. To be as successful as she is now and to battle her way to where she is now, I think she did have a plan. No one's that lucky. VH1 Deeper with No Doubt is next, part of a VH1 Diva Marathon. Oh, and a little note to my wife's divorce lawyer, I am not in love with Gwen Stefani. I just happen to think she's neat. VH1.com.